Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining me today for another episode of How to Win at Everything. I am here with my good friend, Tony McClellan, who is actually here from the UK. So she is actually up at one in the morning <laughs> to actually be with us today. Uh, thank you, Tony, for joining us today. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. I'm going to go ahead and play my cheesy little intro to start us off. And I will be right back with you. Have you ever wondered why you struggle to find success or fulfillment or lasting happiness? It's probably because your default wiring is set to lose. The How to Win at Everything podcast looks at real people who have struggled with the same insecurities, fears, doubts, and expectations and found a way to succeed. Why? Their brains are rewired for success. We dive into their thought patterns to show you how to rewire your own brain to win at everything. All right, all right. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us this evening. So I am here with Tony McClellan. Uh, Tony is, and you'll see this if you look at her LinkedIn profile, she is a critical friend, which we'll get into a little bit later. She's also a business mentor. Um, but I don't want to do any any disjustice here, Tony. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. Uh, tell us what a critical friend is, obviously, and uh, why we call you the uh, fire putter outer. Yeah, so um, so hi everyone. I'm I'm Tony McClelland. Uh, critical friend is is really that critical friend that everyone needs. That's really gonna tell it as it is and very tactful. So um, I'm known for that. I've got a reputation of doing of of being that. So that's where that kind of come from. And um, you know, business mentor because I I do lots of work around uh, business startups. So. You know, um, I explain it by saying that I put fires out at one end that are normally blazing, and then I start fires at the other end with people that are just starting out in business. So all of the learning that I'm getting and all of the richness that I'm getting from, you know, the blazing fires mm -hmm. all around people and culture, I'm bringing back 360 back to people that are just starting out in business. So hopefully they can take on board some of the learning and I share that as I go. So mm -hmm. the main things that I do, the four main things that I do are, I help businesses navigate crisis. So business contingency, continuity. You know, I normally get the emergency call when the graph is dip, dipping or peaking. I help C-suite executives to get into their role. I help businesses start up mm -hmm. and I underpin DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion in all of it. And mm -hmm. my specialist area is criminal justice, education and care and services providing provisions for vulnerable groups. So, so that's really my specialist piece. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, there's a lot to kind of pull apart in what you said. Um, let, let me start with this. I, I remember you telling me you started off working with government, right? With local government? Yeah, yeah, I started. Here, tell us, tell us what that was like. What's that about? Uh, what were you doing exactly? Well, in, in government, what happens is, is that when I, was a, when I was actually at college, I, uh, you know, my tutor, he, you know, he, um, I, he said that I was like a role model student. And actually, yeah. I ended up doing, you know, uh, doing a, teaching a module of his course right. and um you know so i was always there and and helping out and everything and uh one of his colleagues in a local authority said look i need somebody and he said i've got just the person so for me starting out in local authority it was you know it was a really tough piece it was a really tough project tony we've got this this area no one wants to work there they burnt the youth club down it's it's <laughs> oh wow awful can you go in and fix it and and i was like well well yeah why not you know hey let me go in and see if i can fix it and so that was really i was kind of thrown right into the fire and um yeah 
so that's that's kind of where that was but but what i found was that i was really kind of championing the 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 people that i was working with you mm. know and um i remember i went on a course and the, and while i was on that course you know they said uh, that if you follow the the guidelines and the policies yeah an individual can sue the local authority mm -hmm. if you don't they can sue you so i said right okay so that's fair enough can i have your policies please because i don't want to be sued right. that's what the problem was <laughs> Yeah, there were no policies. <laughs> Where's your policies that I can protect myself and staff? There were no policies. And so uh -huh. that's where it started. I started do doing the deep dive and really getting those policies sorted. And um, so that kind of put me in a really different space. So that's kind of where, where I started out in my journey. But what also did was it meant that um, the, the real learning point in there was the fact that people that were on the ground mm -hmm. yeah, weren't listened to and you had the people that are around the strategic table and i just thought how can i get our view up around the strategic table and that was yeah. a time where i really promised myself that when i do get around the strategic table i'm not going to forget the people that were on the yeah. ground but what it meant was that the closer i got, got to the strategic table they wouldn't I didn't I didn't feel as if I was getting the respect that I needed because yeah. I always had my foot with the grassroots people grassroots yeah so I had to break free yeah just to be able to get the respect around the table and when I did I was always looking for ways Please. yeah yeah to to be able to um to incorporate Give it back. yeah get it back incorporate that back so so for me it was a real turning point and and in that role there i learned so 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 much you know just in terms of you know people that are important i was given a whole list of people to go yeah. and check out as part you know they give they give you a list for your induction so you need to see all these people but actually i figured out that they were not the important people <laughs> yeah. right. they, i had on there you need to see the head the head teacher of the local school. You need to see the chairperson of the residence association. You need to see the person that's at the council of this person. But actually, when I got there, I realized that they weren't the key players. Mm. The key players were the caretaker, the guy that lived at number six. Mm. <laughs> the right. key players. And I think sometimes what happens is, is that we look in the wrong places yeah yeah for the wrong things yeah and, and i remember you telling me about that that one of the one of the things that you do immediately when you go into these organizations that are having problems is you actually cite who who, who the movers and shakers are and i remember you telling me it's usually never the the the, the head person right it's usually going to be somebody who is uh, is there is usually not the quarter office guy. It's usually somebody, uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Woman that's, yeah. And that's that, and that is just so key, Kelly, because you know, um, I get I get businesses come to me. They come with two hundred page documents. Oh, we've got a problem. Can you read? Can you have a look at our our strategies and tell us what's wrong? And I just say to them, I'm sorry, but the answer is probably not going to be in the strategy because that's just words on paper. Yeah. It can say absolutely anything it wants. But what I need to do is come into your organization, you know, and just spend a day. And I'm going to be 80% there. By coming into your organization, I'm going to identify the movers and shakers because it's not the people in the big office, in the big chair. Yeah. In the big white swivel chair. You know? Right. <laughs> it's, it's not those people. And it's not the person that's commissioning me to do the work. The yeah. people I'm looking for, I'm going to find in the back of the staff room. Mm -hmm. yeah? So, you know, they're the movers and shakers because then the people commissioning me are not the movers and shakers. Those are the movers and shakers that are the influential ones that I'm looking for. If I go and sit in the back of a, a, a leadership meeting and just listen with my eyes, that's going to tell me so much more mm -hmm. than me reading a 200 page document because the answers, Kelly, are not in the paper the yeah. answers are with the people with the people always the case right yeah so, people power right 
<laughs> let, let me ask you this, Tony. So I know that I know that I, you know I affectionately call you all of this stuff, the uh, including the critical Fran and the fire putter outer. What what I I know that there are probably some differences in how uh, from the UK to the US and how we do some of the uh, how we do how we do some of this stuff. But some of these things are just straight across the board. Uh, things that you're going to find in businesses that need help. So, so I I want to spend a little bit of time talking about your background and how you're how you're bringing this stuff to people. But I also want to try to get in some of your expertise. So, when what in your estimation, in your experience, what are the things that people should start looking at uh, immediately so that they'll know? Oh, hey, this is uh, this is something where I may need a, a Tony to come in and, and get me straight. What 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 are the like the telltale signs that we can look at in our businesses to know if we need some help? Well, normally it's in the culture, yeah, because the culture goes a bit. It, oh. It's a bit toxic, mm-hmm. and it's it's normally down to the people. And I found whether it's roles that I've had or working with others, I have actually found that. The more you involve people, the better the result is. You know, that's what I've actually found, that always engage them. Because what we do as professionals, we always try to get things lined out. We've got to get it lined out from number one to 10 before we get these people involved and dictate and tell them. But actually, why don't we involve them in the process? That's what I found is so, so much easier and better and quicker you know and a good example of that was um one of one of the projects that i worked on very early was it was a bid that somebody else wrote and i was asked to go in and deliver on it it was with young people uh this was very very early on in my career and what happened was is that i had to report back to the funders in like about six weeks mm-hmm. i didn't have a building i didn't have anything i was the walking project wow yeah if i was over there the project's over there if i was over there the project's over there (laughs) all right so i really felt like i need to find um a building we need to have a base we need all these things in place yeah then i can recruit the young people to you know to get the funding um the the funding report done and then move in that order. And sometimes things don't have to go in that order because I found as the time was coming down, Kelly, I had about two weeks, I still didn't find a home. And I realized oh, wow. I needed to submit this, 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 um, this report. So what I actually done is I recruited the young people first mm-hmm. and they helped me to find the location. Interesting. I used them to guide me. So it became our project, not my project, our project. And so they helped me to shape it. And it was really, really, so it's like, no, don't have it over there. Don't have it on this day. It's got to be easily accessible. So for me, it wasn't, I had, you know, people that I was working with, Uh young people. And it was, it worked out really, really well because it meant that, that I wasn't producing something. It meant that, we were co-creating, co-producing, yeah. and there was more ownership to it as well. So, so it was really, really fascinating. And, and at that very early time, it showed me that um, bring people in, bring mm-hmm. them in. You don't have to be bogged down with all the details. And so, I've, it's something that I've seen consistently, consistently. You know, one of my one of my one of my um, earlier projects again. It's the same thing. Got to bring them in. Mm-hmm. Bring them in. Hear, hear from the people, and they will, they will be guided by you. You know, and and I, I just realised that the very early I had this gift to help people and share and bring them in and get them involved, and I just kind of carried on like that. And as I stepped up, huh. you know, I was just bringing more people in. I remember I had um, a good job in the local authority and had my own office and everything. And, you know, I started a a big campaign. I had a story where a young person was suffering from domestic violence. We had a conversation and I realized that I need to do something to support her. Mm -hmm. Was if there was a project that was a, you know, um, a website where she could go and get some help, that would be great. 
then I thought, well, actually, if there was a radio show, that would be great because that will reach a different set of yeah. people. And it was all of those things. So what, very quickly, I realized that communication is key to everything, people and communication. And, you know, there, there's, that's always where the answers are. And even now, so many years later, that's where it, that's where the answers are. So let, let me ask you this, because you, you bring up a good point, uh, actually a couple of good points I want to touch on, uh, or that I want you to touch on. One is this piece where there seems to be, it seems like uh, this is kind of woven through your first couple of things you talked about, where you're reaching out and talking to the people who other people aren't talking to, uh, whether it's in the boardroom, whether it's in the community. What is the value I mean, I'm assuming it's a value in buy, people buying in, but what have you found has been the value uh, with getting those kind of people on board, the people who are actually a part of it, the people who are helping versus getting the people who, like you said, maybe the people who are funding. Uh, it sounds like it may be more important to get those other folks on board. Is that what you've experienced? Well, I think that anything that you're doing, you know, in my opinion, mm -hmm. whatever group you're working with or working for, it's got to be for and by so if it's for young people it has to be by young people okay so whatever the group it's for and by so and that's the same principle when i chaired my residence association it's for the people by the people mm -hmm. and, you know as a leader i just kind of feel that you have to be guided by the people hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I i'm almost surprised that 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 you didn't go into politics with this because I feel like this is uh, th these are these are places where a lot of people would have said I can I can do I can do for myself uh, you know and, and get uh, to get publicity to get to get known and that sort of thing except it looks like you took like a, a different path and you start saying on a grassroots level I can personally help people what what is it that uh, is this something that you've had for a long time, did you start off with with young four year old Tony doing this for people? Like, no. where did it come from? Can I just say that when I was doing my projects and I even had an international campaign, I was in the I was getting a lot of publicity. I was in the right, news right. all the time to the point where my mum was like, you know, oh, you're in the newspaper all the time. When my sister got an award to for for some of her work that she was doing, you right. know, my mum was like, oh, this is really exciting. Oh. And I was like, but, but my mom was in the newspaper, you know, last week. And she was like, well, you're always in the newspaper <laughs> kind of thing, you know? So uh -huh. was getting a lot of recognition because right. the power was rising, the ripple effect when you get people involved. Right, right. They support you. You trust them, you respect yep. them. They realize that you're doing something for hmm. them, empowering them, which is a really important word, um, empowering them and they feel empowered and listened to. And that's where they, they start to rise. When you instill that in them, that's mm. where they start to rise. But for me, I always knew that, that I had something in me. You know, I can remember when I was at school in, in, in terms of um, you know, entrepreneurship and business, you know, I always knew that I had something in me. I, I can remember uh, you know, running my school tuck shop you know, giving mm -hmm. up every mm -hmm. great time to run this tuck shop for people, you know, and um, one Wait, day... Let, let me pause you, Tony. Can you explain what that is? A tuck, sorry, a tuck shop was like a, a break time where we had crisps and sweets and things like that, and people could just come and buy with their, with their, uh, with their pocket money. So yeah. we had this tuck shop and, um, you know, it was really busy and it was making some money. And I remember I went to my teacher and I said... Uh, when can I get paid, miss? And she said to me, paid? I said, yeah. Like, yeah, pay. <laughs> yeah, like, and she said, there's no pay. And I said, but miss, I don't understand. What do you mean? There's no pay. I'm giving up all my break time <laughs> for the people. Right. And you're not going to pay me. So, uh, you know, but... But that's where it started and she did pay me and then it you know i started falling in love with uh with with clothes and shoes you know and i quickly figured out in the net in my next job that it was 
it was better, more profitable for me to <laughs> not pay money, but actually right. pay wages in clothes because I got more and it went further with my discount. And so there, you know, it went like that. And even in my local authority roles, I was, I had a campaign, like I was saying to you, and it just grew and grew and grew because of people that were involved in it. And we had different spin-offs. We had one minute, we had a website that was giving information to this young lady about domestic violence. Then we were doing plays and theater through forum theater to people that wanted to play. Mm -hmm. We got radio licenses for people that wanted radio. We mm -hmm. had a magazine for, for people that wanted to, and it was just spreading and, and all these skills and everybody wanted to be involved and it was making money. It was bringing money in to the local authority. And I was like, I was just dealing with it like it was a business, mm -hmm. bringing money in until my manager sat me down one day and said, um, Tony, you know, we're not supposed to be making money like this. <laughs> we're government. <laughs> we get money. But, you know, that was my whole thing. It was about bringing the money in and making the money out of it. And so, that was that whole mentality kind of followed mm -hmm. me, followed me through. And um, and even when I had this this massive campaign, it reached international level. Mm. You know, I I was even everybody wanted to be a part of it. All this money was coming in. Everyone wanted to be a part of it. And I remember I was kind of um, I had my office and I was giving opportunities to young people to do work experience. They'd never been in the council office before. Yeah, yeah. And so. Uh, so apart from the fact that I had to sit them down and explain to them, you know, don't be rude to the security man on the door. Do not, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, so, so you're bringing in people from the community directly. Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. Through the campaign. And right. so it was like when all these people started coming and because it was a youth crime campaign, I had lots of funding. So mm -hmm. you know, I was bringing them into the council offices and, and just creating spaces for them to be able to work and show them. And so I always had, um, someone used to call me the Pied Piper because I always had like a train of people that were yeah. dancing behind me that were looking for these opportunities. And we just created some really, really magical things. But what happened is that I turned the power back to them. Hmm. So they were consulting, they were consulting the police about things. They were consulting policy. We had massive consultations, but mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. asked them the questions rather than trying to find the answers ourselves. Hmm. Uh, let me ask you this, Tony. Uh, I, I want to kind of drill down to some of the some of the building blocks of, of the ways that 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 you seem to have. So let me ask you: uh, did, did did you grow up? Did your family grow up well to do? Not so much. Where were you guys at uh, economically? No, not well to do at all. It was just like, it was me. Um, I had two sisters, mum, dad. We weren't on an estate, but, you know, not, you know, attached to an estate, you okay. know? So, um, so, yeah, it was. So, it was some humble it, upbringing, right? Right? Yeah, humble it, beginnings? It was, it was humble. It was humble. Do, do you think that plays a part in your, like, because you're almost insistent on bringing in the people who maybe are underrepresented. Do you think maybe that plays a part in that, or is that uh, from somewhere else? Wow. Because you're clearly able to identify with people who are in need or people who are maybe underrepresented, because that seems to be a big part of what you're doing. Yeah. And I think, even. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not really sure, but I think one of the things that was a turning point is I actually knew somebody that died in police custody, hmm. yeah? And I was on the residence associate, my, the chair of the residence association, and I was, I was working with the family when that actually happened. And so therefore, what, what, what happened was I was almost in a lead capacity, going yeah, through yeah, yeah, yeah. and understanding and all of that. And that's, that was what my first step was into law when I started studying uh, criminology and law at that point. You know, so it was um, applied criminology, community safety and youth justice. So I was really starting to get into behaviours and yeah. innate, taught, habitual and learned behaviours. Mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. I really understand people, but in terms of the law as well. And I felt like I was moving into this world of um, discrimination and intersectionality and all of those things. 
And I just felt that, wow, you know, in this particular case, there were so many different flaws, so many different things that were going on that actually this was an area that I wanted to step into and make a difference. So that's kind of maybe that that kind of was a first yeah. stone in there. I, I went onto this estate, was doing some youth work, and I realized that, that, that the youth work that I was doing wasn't even youth work because I was, you know, they were coming in and I was trying to get them jobs in the evening. Yeah, yeah. So I realized that this isn't going to work. I need a day, a, a day work, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. day work to be able to get them the job. So that's so I changed my role from a youth work to something more senior to get them jobs. Yeah, yeah. and then moved from there. And we had lots of funding, um, regeneration funding at yeah. the time. You know where they were regenerating areas, and so from there I just kind of grew and grew and grew and but but it, everything that I've done in my career mm -hmm. which it has been around criminal justice the youth offending teams young people in the criminal justice system guns gangs all of that kind of stuff I've done specialist education so I've I've moved in the specialist education field I've been a principal of mm -hmm. a PLD school yeah for young people with disabilities as well as you know, people with challenging behavior or autism. And I've also worked in the care setting as well, where young people are disadvantaged. So I kind of feel yeah. that, that I've really got that understanding and yeah. Uh, yeah. That empathetic side, you know, that, that really connects with people to want to help them. And so um, that's really my background. And, and I don't feel that it was, I was directed that way. I just mm -hmm. kind of fell that way because some of it was about my curiosity. Yeah. Understanding behavior. Okay, I understand behavior a little bit. Now I need to understand how people learn. I go into education. Okay, now I understand how people learn and the differentiation and how everyone's different. Now I need to understand about environmental factors. And so mm -hmm. for me, the three-pronged methodology became even more important because it was about understanding behavior, understanding learning, and understanding environment. environment yeah. And sometimes you just need to do a slight shift to get the difference. And so that's how I work. I work with leaders and people to get them to really um, understand how they work, their personalities, how they take on board learning. Because I've led organizations before and I've looked back and I can see my whole personality behind. And uh, that's what it that's what it is. So I'm really interested in the behavior piece and uh, toxic culture. Interesting. So so with the with the way that you've been working with, I mean, pretty much everything grassroots from neighborhoods to police, like you said, gangs, youth. How much of that translates into the way that you're able to work with organizations? Like, is, is there some sort of. Um, uh, what's the commonality between, you know, maybe organizations on a grassroots level and big corporations? Well, I think the commonality is, it's that behavior piece. The more you understand okay. the people at the helm, the better the results are. So the more you understand the people, the better the results. And it doesn't matter yeah. whether it's a small organization or a larger one. The larger one, there's just more to look at. There's more money to look at. There's more pieces to it, you know, mm -hmm. so whether it's one person, individual that's just starting out a business or a large corporation, there's more moving parts. Right. But there's a lot of similarities in terms of the people that are running the businesses and how they leave their imprint within within the business, you know. So so really it's about them. Um, and at the moment, what I'm finding at the moment is that there's so many people that are coming with the solutions mm -hmm. with this training that training this answer but how can you come with the solution if you don't really really understand the problem and the mm -hmm. problem lies with you know because I, I i hear people say oh they don't listen they need to change their behavior you know but it's if it's, exactly. a, if it's a behavior that's been embedded since they were four or five years old, how are they just going to change overnight? You know, so really we need to dig deeper, understand if it's a learn or a taught behavior, mm -hmm. what kind of behavior it is. How does this person take on board learning? Are they a kinesthetic audio or visual learner? Piece mm -hmm. it 
together. What's the environment they're in? When I do my work in this way, I really get to understand human behavior and humans, and it's very personalized. And what happens is, is that as consultants, we, you know, well, I shouldn't even say we, because I don't know more, but we have a set way of thinking, yeah, set way of working, and everybody has to fit into this set way of working. And if they don't, it's like it all goes wrong or you can't work with them. But yeah. I try and do it the other way around. I try and, just your work and, and ad adapt, yeah. based on the experience, adapt. So if I've got 10 clients now doing the same program, they're all doing it differently. Makes sense, yeah. But it's so, so, so important that we look at everybody as an individual Mm -hmm. And we don't. We've all got our own DNA and we've all got, all got our own fingerprint. So why are we under this um, one blanket approach for all? Yeah. Why are we under that? You know, I used to, um, I used to, you know, run netball clubs. Yeah. And uh, I'm, can I, can I tell you a, sto a story? Really yeah. Quick? Give me really? an example. So I'm going to use a netball example because anyone that knows me knows I'm always going to try and get a netball story in. But uh, really, can, it's a can, can, I, can I have you explain netball first, though? Yeah. So it's Where? a second side game. It's it's um it's similar to basketball, but we can't move with the ball. But it's a seven side game, and uh, it's played by men and women, but mm -hmm. typically, typically women. And um, so I had a centre player, and the centre player would always have the ball and pass it to the wing attack and run behind that player and i'd say to her well look don't you know you can't run behind because your, your opponents will be able to suss you out very quickly and shut you down she kept on doing it her teammates were playing around her yeah and then tried to explain to her you can't do that and <laughs> she you know she just kept on doing it mm -hmm. anyway so I start. I, I thought I'm going to look into this a little bit more. So I started to do some one to one with her, and one of the things that came to light is the fact that she had autism. Uh. So she likes routine. She likes to do the same things over mm -hmm. and over and over. Now, if I didn't have that experience and knowledge, I wouldn't have been able to identify that. Yep. So now that I know that she she likes routine, I just needed to make sure that. Uh, she knew the right routine. I gave her the winning routine. That's yeah, right. Yep. So that she yep. could win a win and win rather than go <laughs> behind the win all of the time. So so that's what we worked on. But if I didn't yeah. have that skill and knowledge or experience, another person would have come and said, I'm sorry, you're not good enough. You don't listen. Yep. Yep. And put her on the bench. She's suddenly excluded. Yep. And so I use that as an example because leaders need to start thinking about people in that way. When you're delivering training, delivering CPD, mm -hmm. and typically one of the things that people don't start out, when they're starting up a business, they don't think about staff they're bringing on board and training and all of that. And it's the same thing in the organizations, the bigger organizations. When I go in and I ask them for, where is your workforce development plan, please? Where is your workforce development strategy? Because that is the heart Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's the strategy that says what you're doing to develop your people yeah what the perks are what the train is are there shadow opportunities if that's not there then mm. we've got a problem yeah because you're not setting anyone up tells anyone else to be uh successful or to grow um this uh this brings up kind of a good point. I've been talking to a couple of people today, actually, where this point has come up, uh, and April kind of brings this point up, too. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Tony, uh, I want to say, actually brought this up a little bit to me earlier about the need for uh, accessibility and adaptability for people who uh, are, are differently able because of the fact that there's so much, uh, it, even as far as... Um, uh, as far as tapping into these these guys as a resource, there's so much there. Um, is it is it is it when it comes to uh, whether whether it's disabilities, whether it's whether it's it's race, whether it's gender, what what is there a is there a certain type of mindset that you're finding in leadership where they either don't know how to tap into these different things, or is it just about they don't know how to develop people? Where where where's the issue with leadership where? they would have just kicked the uh the young lady off the team well some some it, you'll find it in a variety of different places 
-hmm. One of those things is about the behavior piece that I explained earlier on, that if somebody comes in and tries to do an executive coaching program, for example, that's going to last for three months, six months, it might not change mm -hmm. that person because it's an embedded behavior from they were younger. Yeah. It's an embedded learned behavior that sometimes they don't even realize that they've got. So that's where you need to dig deeper. Yeah. So sometimes it's about that individual and that behavior. And that's where all of, you know, you asked me about my upbringing. Mm -hmm. That's where their upbringing comes into it. Because yeah. their upbringing will influence their mindset mm -hmm. and how they, they behave to the point where they actually think it's normal. You and I might think it's different. Then there's the piece of remember everybody's different. We have a different DNA. We have a different fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Two black women, same age, are still different. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Don't treat everybody the same. Understand that, and, and everybody brings that difference. When you allow them to bring that difference to the party, it's, it's just a, such a different type of party. So when you're bringing in training or CPD, don't just assume that everybody can sit and listen to somebody. Yep. yep. Not everybody wants to jump on a computer and do, you know, do this work. That's right. I'm, I'm you know, there, recently we were doing some, some, some government work and, um, you know, we're doing some government work around the disability strategy and doing some round tables and everything. Mm -hmm. Remember I said the disability strategy, yeah? Right. Remember I said the disability strategy. Mm -hmm. And yet there's people that can't even get on the computer That's to right. do the round table. Yep. Why are we not thinking about those people that can't get on the computer because yep. they're the ones that have, have the lived experience? Mm -hmm. They can't, they have a disability. And so they, sorry, have I, have I been repeating myself because, you know, I just can't understand mm -hmm. how we're not really taking that on board. Why are we not thinking about that? Why, you know, well, even when we're announcing about COVID, why are we not, why haven't we got people doing sign language? Why haven't mm -hmm. we got, got things simplified, you know? And I just now, think that the real basic, basic things are just being missed. Now, now, see, but again, now that makes me wonder, is this, uh, you, you know what they say, profits roll up and other stuff rolls downhill. So it makes me wonder where, where, where do the, um, where's the responsibility lie? So if, if, if I'm middle management, I have no control over, anything except maybe the day-to-day -day employees do you know if, what if, we started on this responsibility because your show just ain't long enough <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started on that but do you know well, 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 give, it, give, give us give us some some portion of how you feel about it yeah because i think what happens is when i go into an organization I'm actually, the leaders I'm looking for is I'm looking for where the accountability and responsibility lies okay that's where I'm looking, because it's not the person that's got the title of leader. Yeah. yeah. There's other people that take that responsibility. They're my leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I've said is that, and this is where it's so important. When I was in an organization and I had 350 staff that I was managing, I used to be a part of that induction on the very first day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would set aside an hour. They would come to my office. We would drink coffee and I would just try to get to know them as individuals. Mm. Yeah. Now, I found that that was really, really important to get to know these people and know these individuals and know them from the start. And that's kind of that's part of it as well, Kelly. You know, mm. that whole thing. When 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 you're doing this, are, are you typically working? Uh, like I, I know you said that the wherever the accountability, wherever the the responsibility is, those are the people who are the actual leaders. But are are when you go into these bigger corporations, are you working with the 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 top person, the the top leader, to get her on the right on the same page or to get him on the same page? Okay, I am, I, I am, I am working with them but i'm also trying to show and that is a big part of my work trying to show them yeah 
the little things that they can do to make a big difference. So uh, anyone that knows me knows that I love the Pareto 80-20 rule, 20% effort in, 80% yeah, result yeah. out. And that example that I just gave you is about the leader coming uh, with, with those people. And on the first day, yeah, mm -hmm. making sure mm -hmm. they understand what the organization is about, making sure they understand what they're accountable for. Yeah. So after yeah. they finish with me, the other bit of the induction at the end of the day, when they get their little goodie bag, there there might be some little sweets and some little love hearts in there. Yeah. Right. We have some little sweets called love heart sweets in there. Okay. You Thank know, you. You know, Thank just you. A, a little sweetener in the in the goodie bag at the end of the day. But trust me, there was policies in there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They need to understand what they're accountable for. And if they don't understand, see the people, the thing about it is the people that are working at grassroots, mm -hmm. they come in and they don't understand what their role is in the bigger picture. So yeah. if they don't understand what their role is in the bigger picture, they can't they be. They can't buy in. Yep. So therefore it's always, oh, I don't make decisions about that. That's down to Kelly. I don't make decisions about that. That's down to Kelly. Kelly decides. Kelly tells us what to do. Mm -hmm. like, no, you're coming in. This is what I'm expecting you to do. This is the bigger picture. This is Kelly's role. This is Sue's role. This is, yeah, and we all feed up into it as one. Mm. That's the picture. And then people know what their role is within the organization and um, are more likely to move to it. And I see so often that people come in, they don't understand the communication is bad because they don't know. It's just a role. Yeah. And so when they come in, I, I'm working with a client at the moment, and I said, when they, you know, the staff come in, it's a yeah. care setting. When the staff come in, you must get them to read the policies and sign to say that they've read, read and understood them. If they yeah. don't sign, it's like, Kelly, have you signed and do you understand the policy? No, I don't. Okay, well, let's get to a point where you can understand it. And then when you've understood it, then you can sign it. And until then, I can't put you on the shift. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and and this makes this makes a difference because I remember you telling me that um, uh, it, we were kind of talking about this idea about buying in and how some people they they they're just there for their wages. They're you know uh, so here's what I want to do. I want to kind of rely on your expertise and your experience a little bit. Uh, I got I got a company. Uh, uh, I I got my own small business here. How how I don't have a gajillion bucks to to put into some fancy training how do i as an entrepreneur on a one-on-one -on -one basis get that that sense of purpose and get my employees to buy in like what what, what would you recommend what are the first things at least that oh, I okay so i think before we even talk about um the employees we need to talk about you so let's focus on you initially what is your purpose what is your mission right yeah that's, that's, that's the first part. And when I work with um, individuals and especially people that are starting out, there's two things that I start with. Purpose and finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is your purpose? What are you trying to do? You know, and how much do you need to keep this organization alive? Mm -hmm. That is the fun fundamental piece. Yeah. Right. I've, I've worked with people that think that if they have, they have to have all these different people doing all these different things. And for every, every duty that they think of, they've got another person in their organizational chart. Mm. No, it, it's going to be costly. So right. you, I think that you need to concentrate on what you want this organization to do, yeah. set out how it needs to make some money to be su sustainable and survive because money does need to come into it. I've been talking a lot about right. people, but you know, money is a, is a, is a thing that's too. Right. Otherwise it's a hobby. Yeah. So, so that's important. That's important in terms of the direction that you're going in. Right. Then you need to look at, and, and when we're talking about purposes, I, I always refer people to the icky guy. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but the icky guy is <laughs> the Japanese concept of wow. being, and purpose and um, anyone that's listening now can go and look it up it's a really really good starting point it thinks it directs you it's four venn diagrams that talk about what you're good at what the world needs what you really enjoy and you know um yeah so it's those 
th those areas. And you've got the sweet spot that's in the middle. Mm -hmm. And quite often people move away from it and think that it's an obstacle. But I always say go with the flow of, of you. Go with what you're naturally good at. So people think that they have to be good at everything in business. Well, actually, you don't. In fact, you don't have to be good at any piece of it. You can outsource all of it. That's right. Yeah? But know what it is that you're good at. Don't interfere that the bit, with the bits that you're not good at because that's where things go wrong and ego comes in. People have a title, they want to, you know, they're all ego driven and they want to give out orders. That's when it's messy in areas that they don't belong. Let, let me ask you this then, because one of the, so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to share uh, the word that, that, that you just told us because I hadn't heard of it uh, and definitely not by that name, at least. Uh, I want to share this, that it is called Ikigai. So, for all of us who are uninitiated with this, uh, how how do you go in and say, hey, discover your purpose? Because it sounds like a lot of the stuff that's going on uh, is going to flow from your own purpose, your own sense of why. Because if you wanted to own a company because you like the idea of having people under you, if you, if you like the idea of being someone's boss, then that's different from serving the world. That's different from how you relate. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. You see, the thing about it is, even if I'm in a larger organization, I'm still focusing on the main individual. Okay. Right. It doesn't mean, it, does, it doesn't make sense me doing something over to the left or over to the right if the main individual is going to change that in three months' time. Right. Most right. Of time. Let me focus on this person first because it's their personality, it's their behavior that's now embedded in the organization. Right. And, and then the, the ego. Yeah. They're the one that's got the ego. They're the one that's going to change things. They, so I need to kind of work out where they're at. What is it that you're trying to do and position them in the right space to be able to do what, so that they're not interfering with everybody else that's doing their other pieces. I've got mm -hmm. a CEO that I'm, I'm working with. And when I'm working with her, it, you know, she, she tries to do everything. And I'm like, but some of the things that she's trying to do, she's not very good at doing. I'm right. trying to say to her that, that our president here, he has a whole team of advisors around him. Uh -huh. He just comes in front of the nation and delivers the message. Yeah? Uh -huh. He just comes in front of the nation with the, the message. So don't feel that if you're the CEO or the leader, you have to do it. It's not a role that the job description doesn't say you must do everything. Yeah? Uh -huh. When you're sitting in a board meeting, you can have these people. It's about trust. You can have your representatives that do HR, finance. George, do you agree with the, the finance figures that's been put right. forward? Yes. Do you, Susan, in HR, do you agree with the, with the HR statements that have been – it's about trust. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know everything. You just need to be able to have an oversight in terms of – and that's one of the things that I say to people, that – you don't have to be great at everything. You don't have to just micromanage everything. And one of the things that I learned very, very early on, Kelly, was that I was very fortunate, yeah, that I had some really, really good managers when I started out in my career. So, and they just left me to it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Budgets, this is your budget. And they just left me to it. And I always knew that, that money was going to come into it because – I was the only one that went into my one-to-ones with my calculator. Right. <laughs> like, you're Tony? ready right in the beginning. <laughs> Where's Tony going with her calculator? What she need her calculator for? So, you know, but but what it, I had some really good managers, and and so for me, I thought that all managers were like that. Hmm. So I left them thinking that I'm going into this world of. Uh, all managers like that and they weren't right do you see what i mean so yeah. i struggled at that point it was a struggling point because it's like all of a sudden i'm being micromanaged suffocated when i've never been suffocated before it's like and then it's so again it depends on who your manager is and you know mm. one person can make such a difference the, now this this makes me wonder though uh, especially when we start talking about um, 
the, the piece about micromanaging and, and, and even with finding your own purpose, if, if you are, um, so, so for the people who aren't the boss, the people who aren't the entrepreneur, the people who are maybe listening, who are just going to their nine to five, how do they know if they're, if their employer, if their if their company is headed in this right direction versus maybe a direction of of you know this place is going to fall because the leadership isn't doing it properly. Like what 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 do you what do, what do they see or what should they be looking for to kind of figure that out? They don't have to look very far. They just need <laughs> to look at are the people happy in their roles? Are gotcha. they in I mean I mean I know that we've had um, the, the last year, which has been absolutely awful and people are working right. from home. But when people were going into work, were they skipping through the door? Are they right. happy? Are they wearing a smile? That's a good starting point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's going to be an easy one to, to figure out too. <laughs> because I know that, that when I'm working and if I, if my, I, you know, I get my staff going, we have fun, but we do some work. Then we have fun maybe some singing and dancing, but then we get some work done, you know? Right. So the thing about it is it's enjoyment. Um, I I do lots of things to get them involved. And gone are the days where people think they can lock themselves up in the office with stacks of paper yeah, yeah, and not have anything to do with the staff. You need to get out there. Get out there, start speaking to the staff, start building the relationships, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. You know what? Now you 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 mentioned this kind of again earlier with this idea of trust. Um, in 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 an organization, uh, and and I'm going back to this idea of being the the head person, the 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 whoever the person is who pays the bills. How 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 it must be really tough to trust people because most people aren't doing it. You know, we want to do all the work ourselves, or we want to micromanage someone. All of that has to do with trust. How is it how? Excuse me. When you go into an organization, how how are you helping people to build that sort of trust? It's about getting to know people as individuals. It's for me, Kelly. I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, a lot of my work is built on relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I work with people now that I've been working with for the last twenty five years. They come to me because they know what they're going to get. We've built a relationship. Mm -hmm. Even when people connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm building a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. I'm not selling them. I'm not selling anything. Do you, do you see what I mean? So it's yeah. so it's like that whole relationship when people get to understand you, get to know what you do. Then I mean, I have people drop in my in my inbox daily asking for fairy dust. That's right. Hashtag Tony's fairy dust. <laughs> I just had to say to somebody just a couple of days ago that I'm out of stock. You know. And that I'm stocking up because when you're building a relationship, that is more important and and really understanding the person. And so many times yeah. I've seen a challenge ahead or some kind of difficulty that we need to maneuver. And you know what? Just by sitting down and having a conversation with them about it could be about nothing seemingly important. Yeah. Sometimes the answer comes to the comes to the fore, you know, and um this is this is the thing. This is the thing. Build a relationship. And that's why I said when they're coming in through the door the first day, build that relationship with them. Hmm. Hi, Kelly, how are you? Everything okay? A few days later, I see you down the cor corridor. It's a different conversation. You feel that you can approach me and hmm. I'm going to get it raw. Huh. I got to tell you, uh, this all sounds so much like common sense. But it obviously there's a there's a gap there because so many people are missing that. I, and, but but the part that I think that really, I guess, it makes me angry honestly because I get to see on a daily basis there's this lack of a sense of we are all human beings because what human beings don't see each other in a hallway and speak? You know what what where are you at if 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 you are hiring people that you don't want to talk to? And and things absolutely simple things because yeah. you yeah. know just, just having a weekly drop in people come and they speak to you just on a one to one they think that you're unaccessible yeah and yeah. come and speak to you 
you know, I worked in organizations where people were like, oh, wow, did you talk to that guy? That's the president. How could you be talking to him? It's like because he has blood and veins and water going right. through him just like him. That's <laughs> right. And you need to make yourself accessible. And it's, yeah. but it's really that whole thing of once leaders start getting into everybody being an individual, yeah, not just Tom from accounts, but yeah. Tom has got a life, he's got a wife, he's got children. Right. Right. Be interested. Learn what the learn something, and I try to to remember something really personal about each and every per. You know, hmm. if the cat had to go to the vet, remember yeah. what the cat's name was. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Or, yeah. or how's your son getting on? How's your daughter? How's your da mum, dad? You know, something. Remember something because people want you to remember them. They want yeah. to feel personalized. Yeah, they want you to know, feel valued. Yeah. I called. I was called into an organisation that was that was losing a million pounds a year. Oh. Yeah, on agency staff. Wow. So they were paying out a million pounds on agency staff per year, wow. plus they were paying other staff that were off sick. Oh, yep. yep. So they're paying double, triple, nearly. And with the agency, even though they're paying that amount, they're still not getting the work done. Because wow. the agents don't know the work as well as the others. And, um, you know, so because they don't do that, they don't, it, it's almost like the people that are off work sick. Why are we not paying attention to how can we make some workplace adjustments for you? Do you see yeah. what I mean? It's yeah. like fit into this JD or not. Mm -hmm. If you don't fit into the JD, stay off sick. We'll pay you until we figured it out, figured it out, figured it out. Even though it's costing us, mm -hmm. because we don't have the capacity to even think about how we can make any adjustments. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean, it's like it comes back to what I said earlier on about people as individuals. You know, because that's where if if you concentrate on making them happy, treating them as individuals, and bringing the smile, the mm -hmm. smile. Take care of the KPIs. Uh, I, I'm going to appreciate uh, your use of, of all the abbreviations. JDs, I'm going to say, are job descriptions. Sorry, yeah. yeah KPIs, key performance uh, indicators. Uh, indexes. Oh, indicators, okay. But that's so, uh, kind of like the money, the money side of it sometimes if it's a profit-making organization. So yeah. sometimes we're really driven, target, target, target. Yep. Got to bring this money. But actually, if you focus on generating a smile, the money will come. Uh, yep, and, and there is actually science behind that. That's not just guesswork. That is, there is actually literal science behind that. Uh, Tony, uh, I know I know that it's almost two a.m. for you right now, so I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to ask you a bunch of rapid fire random questions like I told you I was uh, right. to see. Uh, I was going to go in. I was going to go all into it, but instead, uh, I, I want to get this as somebody who is obviously uh, very, very into your purpose and, and, and what you're doing. I, I, like, I know one of the things that we talked about before is that every time you saw the fact that there were people who were having decisions made about them that weren't at the table, your, 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 your feeling was even if you couldn't get them to the table right then, you weren't going to forget that feeling of, of, of how that was. And that's a part of the things you do. Like, so I know you're really, really, that's really integrated into you. Let me ask you this. At the end of the day, when you retire, when you're your deathbed, whatever it is, how will you know that Tony has lived her purpose? Her, her life has been, is equaled up to what she wanted it to be. How you know, what would that look like for you? It would look like what it looks like now. Hmm. I'm living it every day. I'm doing it every day. I can feel it in my heart. <laughs> I can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, my dad was a good person. He passed a number of years ago. And uh, one of the things he, he said to me before he passed was that as long as you're okay and everybody's okay, then I will be okay. Hmm. And, um, and I saw what that actually meant in real life. And uh, I feel that I'm taking on his uh, legacy hmm. and I'm just trying to live that life and I'm trying to do good, bring positive energy, bring the best out of people, have fun along the way. And it, 
it brings results, you know. So for yeah. me, I'm doing it. The only thing that I want to really be doing is looking at ways that I can do it better if it can impact more people. So a lot of my work is like a small doing a small thing with a big impact. Um, but um, if I can always look at ways to improve what I'm doing, that it can reach more people, then that's great. But one of the things that I, and that story I told you about the, you know, the grassroots and the people around the table. So I'm around the table. I'm around the big table making some big decisions. Mm -hmm. but do you know what? That's why I feel the need to still be lighting this fire with people at grassroots level. Because I need, yeah. to, and even I do that even on LinkedIn. I yeah. do with the influencers i could be doing that i've seen some of them growing they're big i was around the same time but you know what i'm more interested in people that are, are grassroots that have got something more substantial to say some of them the, the influencers aren't really saying anything right. do, do, do you understand what i mean you scratch okay. below the surface but there's right. people that, that aren't up there that are doing some really great things and just not shouting it as loud Yep. And that's where you'll find me. My husband says that you're always fighting for the underdog. It's like, yes, I am. That's right. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that right there, Tony, is probably the most perfect way to cap it off. That's exactly why we love you. Because even though you're putting out fires to some people, you're lighting fires under us to keep on going and to keep doing the right kind of stuff. So, Thank you. I want to thank you so much for giving us your time today. Uh, I'm going to let you off the hook, let you get some rest. Uh, I, I'm, I'm with Lori here. You're looking great for 2 a.m. So 2 a.m. I'd probably have like a, a, a 7 o'clock shadow beard and everything. It, it would be it would be horrible. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for everyone that's that sent their messages in. So that's great. All right. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, hold on for a second. I'm going to play us out with my cheesy outro. And, uh, and I'll talk to you backstage. Ta -da! <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Oh, wait, here I am. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. <laughs>